The two primary verses or passages of Scripture upon which Roman Catholicism hinges, upon which it depends, is the one we looked at the other night, upon this rock. The way that the Greek translates the Aramaic kipha into you are pebble and upon this boulder I'll build my church, but they don't tell you that. Yes. But the other is undoubtedly the Eucharist from John chapter 6. From John chapter 6. With this in view, turn with me please to the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. Verses 53 and 54, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. When this conference opened, we showed you photos of Caesarea Felipe, and we showed you how to torpedo upon this rock. Now I will show you how to biblically torpedo the Roman doctrine of the Eucharist. What does this really mean? You see, you've got to eat it to have eternal life. Well, they have a number of problems. But before I look at the problems they have, even with the Word of God, let's look at the problems they have with their own dogma. This is a Roman Catholic catechism. It is imprimatur. It is nihilat obstat as an official Vatican-approved document. It would have been approved under Joseph Ratzinger, the present pope. According to the published catechism of the Roman Church, outlining its doctrine, salvation primarily comes through the sacraments of baptism and penance. An ex opere operato ritual where you sprinkle an infant where the ritual itself has power to save, even though the infant has no consent. Now, in fact, an infant, Jesus said, suffer the children to come to me. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God does not hold their sin against them until they reach an age of accountability. Why would you take an infant and put it in a coffin and bury it if it wasn't dead? Why would you baptize somebody who's not a believer? Contrary to Romans chapter 6, this is one of the many areas where the mainstream Protestants like the Lutherans, the Reformed churches, the Calvinists, failed to break with Rome. The other is telling a priest your sins and asking him for forgiveness. Uh, again, not practiced anywhere in the book of Acts by the early Christians. It was auricular confession, an ancient ritual in Babylon, but it was not something found in the apostolic church. Nonetheless, if salvation comes through those two sacraments, how can salvation come through eating the Eucharist? They have an internal contradiction within their own system. Now, undoubtedly, they can always explain it, like the rabbis with the Talmud. They can always find a way to tried to reconcile their contradictions even within their own system. But what they can't reconcile is the Word of God with their doctrine. A text out of context, in isolation from its co-text, is always a pretext. A text out of context, in isolation from its co-text, is always a pretext. What did Satan do when he tempted Jesus? Matthew 4. He took a text out of context, in isolation from its co-text. What did Satan do when he tempted Eve? <clears throat> Took what God said out of context. Whenever you see a text taken out of context, in isolation from its co-text, it is the pretext that is the unmistakable signature of Satan. It is the unmistakable signature of Satan. Now, again, my faith is Christian. It is neither Catholic nor Protestant. I agree with what the Protestant reformers said about Rome, but I do not identify with the Reformation. They never fully broke with Rome. 
I do not wish to give people listening on the internet or who watch these videos or DVDs the impression that I'm pro-Protestant, anti-Catholic. Although the Roman Catholic clergy is filled with sex perverts, pedophile priests and nuns, lesbians of every description, at least officially, officially, they don't sanction it. While the United Reformed Church, the Methodist Church, the Anglican Church, and other Protestant churches will ordain homosexuals and lesbians. Even the Roman Catholic Church wouldn't go that low. It takes a Protestant to go that low. Yes, there are liberals in the Roman Catholic Church. There are liberals. Shields, Becks, and Holland, there are liberal theologians in the Roman Church. But the official dogma of the Roman Church would not deny the virgin birth or the literal resurrection or the historicity of Jesus. It takes a Protestant to go that low. Protestantism has become, in its mainstream version, worse than Rome. I am not here to lift up Protestantism. I'm here to lift up Jesus Christ and see what he is saying. Forget about Catholic, forget about Protestant. Six of one, half dozen of the other. They can both go jump off the same cliff in some people's thinking. It's Jesus I believe in. Let, let's look at John chapter 6. What is he saying about this belief? Let's look at the text in context. The Roman church says at the Last Supper, Jesus instituted the Holy Eucharist. The Last Supper, however, was a Passover Seder. It was one of the pilgrim feasts that Jews had to celebrate at Pesach, at Passover, in Jerusalem. John 6 does not take place at Passover or in Jerusalem. Wrong time, wrong place. It is not a primary reference to the Lord's Supper in its context. In its system labor, in its historical setting, it is not even primarily referring to the Lord's Supper. It is talking about Jesus as the antitype or the fulfillment of the manna that fell in the book of Exodus. It's not Passover. Passover had to be celebrated at Pesach, 14th of Nisan in Jerusalem. This is the wrong time, the wrong place. Let's put it in perspective. But let's begin reading carefully John chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, this is an Aramism. Aramisms are like Hebraisms. When you say something twice in a Semitic language, it makes it emphatic. For instance, my wife and myself speak Hebrew at home. We speak Hebrew and English. And if it was really cold out, and I came in and my wife said, Is it cold? And if it was very cold, I wouldn't say, <clears throat> Very cold, I'd say, Cold, cold. Kar, kar. Here in Arizona, I would say, ham, ham. Hot, hot. <laughs> it makes it emphatic when you repeat it. This tells us the original language was not Greek. The original language was a Semitic language. You don't do that in Greek. You do that in Semitic languages. When you see truly, truly, be'emet, be'emet, verily, verily, everything in the context depends upon understanding Truly, truly. If you don't understand what's being emphatically underscored, you won't understand the context. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. Notice right away Jesus is saying, don't think about eating something physical. Think about eating something spiritual. Right from the beginning in the context, he repeatedly contrasts the physical eating with the spiritual. Don't work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. So if the wafer and the wine is transubstantiated and ingested, at what point in the digestive and excretory process does the Eucharist cease to be Jesus, or does Jesus Christ go out with the sewage? I'd like to find somebody explain, do you urinate out the blood of Jesus Christ? They got a problem. It's a miracle. Yeah, it certainly is.
Don't work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give you. For on him the Father, even God, has set his seal. Notice verse 27. It's not the physical, it's the spiritual food. Verse 28, and they said to him, Therefore, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus said, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Notice how many times the word or the term believe, believe, believe is presented and represented and reiterated as the key to eternal life. They said therefore to him, what then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. And Yeshua, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who's given you bread out of heaven, but it's my Father who gives you true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. He's talking about himself. They said therefore to him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Notice, eating belief. Eating belief. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. What is the key to eternal life? Eating or believing? Eating something physical or believing? Believing. Believing what? The Jews, the term Jews here is they have a translation issue from the Greek eudaioi. It does not mean people who were Jewish. They were all Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. It is speaking of the Judeans, the religious establishment who lived in and around Jerusalem controlled by the Sanhedrin. It does not mean people who are ethnically or genetically Jews. It, in the context, it means the religious establishment and those who they controlled who lived in Judea. The Jews, therefore, were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. He was saying he was the manna that fell in the wilderness. And they were saying, is not this Yeshua, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down out of heaven? Now notice, he's not talking about Passover or Paschal language. He's talking about wilderness language. It is not Pesach. It is not Jerusalem. It is Galilee. And they were saying, is not this him? And so Jesus answered and said, do not grumble among yourselves in verse 43. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that any man has seen the Father except the one who was from God, for he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, get this right, truly, truly, bayonet, bayonet. If you don't get this right, you don't understand what he's saying. He who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Judeans, the Jews, therefore, began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? You have in Hebrew thought the mashal and the nimshal. You see this repeatedly in John's gospel. Jesus is speaking on a spiritual level. The people are thinking physically. 
To understand this, this is a rabbinic way of thinking. The book of Proverbs in Hebrew is called Mishlei, the book of Mashals. Like a gold ring through a swine's nose, that's the Mashal, so is the beautiful woman without discretion, Nimshal. The Mashal is a description of something from everyday life. The Nimshal is its spiritual interpretation and application. Jesus was always giving, going for the Nimshal, as the rabbis did. The problem was, ordinary people didn't understand this. They were called the Am Ha'aretz. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you're a ruler of the Jews and you don't know what it means to be born again? The Sanhedrin should have been teaching the people, but they weren't. They were keeping knowledge for themselves to create a political and financial power base for their own aggrandizement to keep themselves in power. They thought the ordinary people didn't know the law were accursed. Remember when Jesus interprets the parable of the vineyard from Isaiah, Isaiah 5, and he had to go explain privately to the apostles what he meant. But it says the Pharisees knew he spoke the parable concerning them. You see this when the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus is asleep. The Bible never speaks of the death of a true believer as death, always sleep. When you go to sleep, you wake up again. Paul says, do not be overly grieved for those who are asleep. The little girl is asleep. Talitatakumi. We shall not all sleep. Unsaved people die. Born again believers sleep. What happens when you die? What happens when you go to sleep? When you go to sleep, your consciousness enters a different sphere. You can see past events happening in the present. You can see future events happening in the present. Past, present, and future become the same in a dream. So, too, you can see dead people alive again. It all makes sense. Well, that's what happens when you die. Your consciousness enters a different sphere where past, present, and future become the same, where the dead are alive again. That's one of the reasons the Bible uses sleep as a way to explain death. It's not death. Unsaved people die. They go to the second death. Real death is second death. To escape the second death, you must have the second birth. Now, we have tapes explaining this, such as uh, Thanatology, a biblical understanding of death in the afterlife. Death is not the mystery we've made it into. The Bible speaks of many mysteries. The mystery of iniquity, the mystery of Christ, the mystery of lawlessness. There's all kinds of mysteries in the Bible, but death is never called a mystery. We've made it a mystery, not God. Jesus talks of sleep. They, they don't understand what he means. Lazarus is asleep. You must be born again. Nicodemus didn't get it. He's always the nimshal, mashal, nimshal, mashal. This is the rabbinic background. He was speaking of something spiritual. Belief, eating is belief. I will show you why. Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also shall live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died, he who eats this bread shall live forever. Now these things he taught them in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Again, it was not Passover, it was not Jerusalem, it is not primarily talking about the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. Wrong time, wrong place. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard these said, this is a difficult statement, who can listen to it? But Yeshua, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you should behold the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. The key to life is the words I've spoken. It's the spirit. The flesh profits nothing. How can eating something flesh, fleshly, how can eating carnum in the Vulgate profit you when Jesus in the very same passage says eating the physical profits nothing? He begins the whole thing in verse 26 by contrasting. You ate the loaves and were filled. 
Don't work for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. It's not the physical, it's the spiritual. That's how he begins. That's how he begins the whole pericope, the whole passage. And he ends by saying, the flesh profits nothing. He is the incarnate word. In Aramaic, mamre. In Greek, dvar. In, I'm sorry, in Hebrew, dvar. In Greek, logos. In In the beginning was the word. In John chapter 1, verse 14, the logos became sarx. The word became flesh. That's what John 6 is talking about. The bread I shall give, even my flesh, he who believes my word and him who sent me has eternal life. He who believes my word, the word becomes flesh. What does this eating his flesh mean? It means the same thing it always meant. Turn back to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 15. Verse 16. Thy words were found, and I ate them. Thy words became for me a joy and a delight of my heart, for I have been called by thy name, O Lord of hosts. Adonai Tzavot. I ate the word, says Jeremiah. Turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3. Verse 1, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me this scroll. Eating the word, believing it. Metabolically, what we eat, we are. As you can see, I am lasagna and haagen Spiritually, the doctrine you believe will determine what you are. What we believe determines what we are. Eat the word. The word becomes flesh. Eat it. Jeremiah, eat the word. Ezekiel, eat the word. Oh, that's the Old Testament. Yes, it is. That's the only Bible the early Christians had. But then they wrote the New Testament. Turn to Revelation chapter 10. And I took the little book in verse 10 out of the angel's hand and ate it. Sweet in my mouth, bitter in my gut. The word of God is always sweet to the mouth, but bitter to the gut. Mmm, wasn't that an encouraging sermon? Mmm, wasn't that an interesting Bible study? Oh, but now I've got to put it into operation in my life. If you don't walk out of church with indigestion, you haven't eaten it. <laughs> the word becomes flesh. Eat it, believe it, make it part of yourself. That is what eating the flesh has always meant. The word becomes flesh. Eat it, believe it. He wasn't teaching anything different than what the prophets taught or what the apostles would teach after him. In the context, he's repeatedly saying, the flesh profits nothing. It's not the physical food. It's not the bread that came down from heaven. Not the physical, not the physical, not the physical. The spiritual believe, the spiritual believe, the spiritual believe. A text out of context in isolation from its co-text is a pretext and the unmistakable signature of not just Satan, but Lucifer. He manifests himself as an angel of light. Roger showed you. This goes back to the worship of the sun and moon, not the God who created the sun and moon. Let's understand this further. 
in order to arrive at these beliefs, you've got to do a number of things. And the Roman Catholic Church has done it. The first thing it did was this. Forget about the context. John 6, verses 68 and 69, when many wouldn't follow Jesus anymore, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, whom shall we go to? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. What does eternal life come from? Belief. Believing the Word. Eating the Word. They have to completely, completely take two verses out of context, just like Satan did when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Just like Satan did when he tempted Eve. Just like Satan is doing today. The text out of context and isolation from co-text is always a pretext. You see that, you see the devil. Rodney Howard Brown was a master at it. John Arnott from Toronto was a master at it. These televangelists, the mammon-worshipping money preachers, are masters at it. It is the signature of Satan, of Lucifer, every time. But Rome takes the cake. Let's look further. In order to arrive at this, you have to do certain things. The first thing the Roman Catholic Church has to do, ironically, is find a way to reconcile its own catechism. If salvation comes by penance and baptism, it doesn't, but that's what they say. How can it come by eating Eucharist? Secondly, if in the very passage, Jesus himself concludes it by saying, the flesh profits nothing. How can they say it profits everything? <laughs> Who do you believe then with Jesus? Repeatedly, that's not what it means. It means belief. Forget about the physical. He begins by saying, the whole passage begins, forget about the physical bread, it's the spiritual. Belief. He ends, the flesh profits nothing. Let's continue. So, the Roman church must first take those two verses, unless you eat of the flesh, out of the context of the chapter. Then they must take those two verses out of the context of the gospel, whereas the word becomes flesh. The key is belief. Then they must take those two verses out of the co-text of the entire Bible. Every place else it talks about eating the word. But then they must divorce it from its sitzim leben, take it out of the Jewish context. This is my body, hoc est corpus meum. That's where they, we get the term hocus pocus. It is. It's hocus pocus. What Jesus would have actually said was this. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the cup. Do this in remembrance of me. In Greek, it's amnesis, literally that you would never forget. We get the word amnesia. It is a memorial. The Pesach is a memorial. My family are Israeli. Every year we have a Pesach Seder. It's the only time we take the Lord's Supper at home as a family. The rest of the time we do it in fellowship. But once a year when we have the family Seder, we take the Lord's Supper during the Seder meal as a family. The rest of the time we do it at the fellowship, but once a year we do it when we have the Passover Seder. It's a memorial. Unsaved Jews look back and look forward. When they eat the Seder, they look back to what God did when he delivered them from Egypt, but they look forward to the coming of the Messiah. So too, when we take the Lord's Supper, it is our Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, the Lord's Supper is the believer's Passover. We look back to what he did on the cross and in his resurrection, 
and we look forward to his coming. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is a memorial of what he did do, and it is an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb, what he will do. Now, if Jesus said, do this in remembrance, if he said it's a memorial, how can they say it is the same sacrifice? Tell me, Mr. Hahn. Tell me, Mr. Keating. Êtes-vous, Monsieur Jean-Marie Lustoge, à Notre-Dame in Paris? Et s'il vous plaît, voulez-vous rendez-vous avec moi? C'est possible? The Cardinal in Paris is uh, Jewish. He should know better than to eat at Jezebel's table. So let's continue. Let's understand this. He says it's a memorial. Turn with me, please, to what they say the first pope wrote. Turn with me to Peter's epistle. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For the Messiah also died for sins once and for all. He dies once. Once. That is why the grain of the first fruit in Leviticus chapter 2 couldn't be sacrificed on the altar. Because Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15. He can only die once. Moses struck the rock more than once. He couldn't enter the promised land. It's like re-crucifying Jesus. He's the rock. Typologically, it's an illustration. Once. Now, the Roman church will say, no, it is the same sacrifice as Calvary. If it's the same one still ongoing, why do you have to remember it? You remember something that happened. You don't remember something you're still doing. Let's go back to Jack and Jill. <laughs> Jack and Jill fell in love. Jack and Jill got engaged. Jack and Jill got married. Jack and Jill went on a honeymoon to Maui. And they celebrated their romance, consummating their marriage in the beautiful tropical environment of Hawaii. And they said, this is marvelous. So in the months and years that followed, they'd say, remember how beautiful Maui was and how romantic it was on Maui? There we were at the foot of Mount Haleakala and the beach and the palm trees. And scenic beauty, wasn't it marvelous? So they decide that they'd go on their honeymoon to Maui. But then, always talking about how good it was and remembering it, they decide to go to Maui for vacation one year, and this time they're going to bring the kids. <laughs> so here they are on Maui. What do they say once they're on Maui again? Remember how beautiful Maui was? <laughs> Remember how impressive Mount Haleakala is? What do you mean you're looking at it? You don't have to remember something you're still doing. It makes no biblical sense, and it makes no logical sense. Zot asu le zikroni, do this in remembrance of me. It is a memorial. It is a Jewish, Jewish ritual. 1 Corinthians 5. Well, let's look at Hebrews. Chapter 7. Verse 27. Jesus, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then the sins of the people, because this he did 
once and for all when he offered up himself. We don't need a priest who makes a sacrifice every day like the Old Testament priests. Because this, our perfect high priest, Jesus did once and for all. No, no, we have to have Mass every day, the holy sacrifice, Hebrews is wrong. Let me tell you about the oldest trick in the book. Turn with me, please, to Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. I will make, literally in Hebrew, I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the one I made with their fathers. He will make a new covenant with who? The church? With whom? The Vatican? With whom? The Baptists? No, the new covenant was made with Israel and the Jews. Forgive me, John Piper, but you're a teacher of error. If God is finished with the Jews, he's finished with you because he never made a covenant with you. Replacement theology adopted by so-called Protestants like Mr. Piper or Rick Godwin. No, 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 no. Invented by the Church of Rome under the influences of Augustine. It was Augustine who abolished the millennium. Jesus said, his kingdom is not of this world. Oh, yes, it is, said Constantine. So Augustine rewrites Christendom to justify it. Both Catholicism and Protestantism draw from the same source, Augustine. See, if you don't believe in a state church, if you don't believe in Erastianism, if you don't believe in sprinkling infants, if you don't believe in patristic authority, the church fathers, as a source of doctrine, never call yourself a Protestant. During the Reformation, you would have been called an Anabaptist. The followers of Luther and Calvin would have killed you just as quickly as the Church of Rome would have. Pentecostals, Baptists, brethren, people like that, dispensationalists, they never would have been considered Protestants during the Reformation. You've got to take it out of its Jewish context. But this new covenant will not be like the one I made with their fathers. Remember, Paul says in Romans 9, the covenants, plural, diethike, belong to the Jews, both the old and the new. You've got to forget the context but it will not be like the one I made with your fathers. What is the oldest trick in the book? Going back under the law. Look at the Galatians, back under the law. John Calvin and his covenant theology. Beza and these people. What is it? Back under the law, covenant theology. The church is Israel. Back under the law. You have an extreme axis of the Messianic movement that people like Arnold Fruchtenbaum and myself oppose. But they are trying to even put Gentiles in bondage to the law. I remember when I read 129 pages that a pastor in upstate New York gave me of the testimony of people who had been in, in the Branch Davidian cult with that David Koresh guy. I was wondering how people could follow this madman. But then I discovered how. Every single one of them had been a Seventh-day Adventist trying to live under two covenants, back under the law. It's the oldest trick in the book. So under the law, the Shekinah was in a box, the ark. But in John 1.14, the word became flesh, and katasteno in Greek, tabernacled among us. He's not in a box anymore. Oh no, put him back in the box, back under the law. Under the law, sacrifices every day. The Roman church, oh yes, sacrifices every day. Back under the law. 
it is the oldest trick in the book. Now, I don't mean cultural observance. My family are Israeli. We observe the Jewish holidays for cultural reasons as, as, as a testimony to the Jewish community and as a way to evangelize unbelieving Jews. Jews should not give up their culture, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Others should not be forced into it, Acts 15. I'm not talking about culture or testimony. I'm talking about legalism, nomianism. The oldest trick in the book. Daily sacrifice. Instead of a priesthood of all believers, no, a separate priesthood like the Levites. We need another Levitical priesthood, holy orders. Back under the law. Well, Aaron typified Christ. He's from the order of Melchizedek. He's a different priest. We have a perfect high priest now. We don't need Aaron anymore. We don't need a priest above the other priests. Oh, yes, we do. Get a pope back under the law. The oldest trick in the book. Let's look. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 28, So the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. He dies once. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 12, but he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, one for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. If something is Perfection, if it is perfected, by definition, you can't make it any better. So they can't say, biblically or logically, it's the same sacrifice because Jesus said it's a memorial of a past one. The Jewish background says it's a memorial of a past one, which is affirmed by Paul in 1 Corinthians 5. It's a memorial of a past one. They can't say it's the same one. They can say it's a renewal of that one. It has to happen again and again and again. He continues to die. Keep striking that rock. Look what it did for Moses. Perfect is perfect. My perfection is in Christ, not in me. Thank God. I'm far from perfect. Fortunately, he is. In other words, the doctrine of the Mass is a fundamental rejection of the cross of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of the Mass is a fundamental negation, rejection of this. It wasn't good enough. God says it was. It was the blood of goats and lambs who were symbols of Yeshua that wasn't good enough. But this was good enough for God. And if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. Roman Catholics be saved. Church of Rome be damned. Jesus Christ will damn that institution to hell. So how do they get this religious thing? It goes back to the church fathers, but they couldn't explain it. It was explained in the Middle Ages, or I should say defined in its present form. There had been three different approaches earlier until Thomas Aquinas came along. Much as Augustine rewrote Christendom as a Platonic religion, Thomas Aquinas came along and rewrote it as an Aristotelian religion. This began in the Muslim world. In the Middle Ages, the Church of Rome 
plunge Western Europe into the Dark Ages. If you want to know what a Roman Catholic world would look like, look at what a Roman Catholic world was like. Look at the Dark Ages. They had 12 centuries to do what they wanted. Look what they did. The Byzantine Empire continued to preserve some culture. And Islam had its golden age, but there was a revival of Aristotelian philosophy in the Islamic world, particularly Alexandria. The Crusades brought this back to Europe. A rabbi named Maimonides, Moses Maimonides, known as the Rambam, rewrote Judaism as an Aristotelian religion. An apostate rabbi, even the others considered him an apostate at the time. So Thomas Aquinas comes along and does what Rambam does. Rambam called it the guide for the perplexed. He had to rewrite Judaism as an Aristotelian religion. And he wrote this big volume called The Guide for the Perplexed how to philosophically explain Judaism or redefine it in terms of Aristotle's philosophy. So Aquinas comes along and does the same thing with something called the Summa Theologia. And he comes up with a way to explain transubstantiation. Before the Enlightenment, science and superstition were the same. After the Enlightenment, Astrology went that way, astronomy went that way. Medicine and pharmacology went that way, folk medicine and healing arts went that way. Okay. Magic and alchemy went that way, chemistry and physics went that way. Okay. What you're seeing now in the world is a rapprochement between science and the occult, particularly in computer video graphics, Biogenetic engineering. You're going to see people using technology to facilitate things with, with cloning, such as uh, reincarnation. You're going to see this happen. We have tapes explaining it, just as in the days of Noah. You're going to see people using biogenetic engineering and virtual technology to facilitate occult practices. It's going to come. We have tape, just as in the days of Noah, we explain it. However, that's not our subject now. I only mention it in passing. Understand what's happening here. The old view of physics and chemistry based on Aristotle believed in a concept that is debunked by modern science called accidents. Accidents are something's appearances. The Greeks knew about atoms, atmos. They knew about elements, stoichiae but they did not know about subatomic particles. They did not know about the transfer of electrons that takes place in chemical reactions between orbits. They didn't know how molecules were formed. They didn't know about ionic bonding. They didn't know about covalency. They knew about none of that. So they tried to explain it in a very simple way called accidents. That's what Aristotle did. Something could actually be something physically, but appear to be something else because that's how they tried to explain the apparent magical changes that took place in chemical reactions. Remember, to them, alchemy and chemistry was the same thing. So when a chemical reaction took place, they thought it was somehow magical. They didn't make the distinction between science and the occult or superstition. In other words, this might look like a pen. It might write like a pen. But that is its mere accidents, it's its appearances. Actually, it's a cigar. Give me a light. You laugh, they believed it. It might look like bread. It might look like wine. It might taste like bread. It might taste like wine, but it's human protoplasm. And if you don't believe it, you are in mortal sin. Now remember, the Roman church is sempre aden, always the same. It has two kinds of doctrines, proxima fede and de fede. It cannot change this, even though chemistry in the modern sense debunks this as rubbish. I studied chemistry, I studied science as a kid. I know what it is. It's rubbish. Somebody who, who, who took chemistry first year university level can prove it's rubbish. I studied physiology when I was a kid. I went from a science background to a theological background. What you have here is bogus science and bogus theology. 
but it's sempre egden, always the same. They cannot change a de fede doctrine. Even though it's scientifically debunked, they have to say, we still believe it. Now today, if you press the Catholic, they would say, well, we accept it by faith. Originally, they didn't accept it by faith. They believed that's what it really was. In other words, this shirt is not red. But the chemical constituency in the dyes in this shirt will reflect that color from the spectrum, okay? You don't believe that by faith. You believe it because it's proven with spectrography. <laughs> well, that's how they believed in transubstantiation. They thought it was a scientific fact. But now science says, no, that was wrong. Yet they still have to continue to propagate it. Give me a light. <laughs> bogus theology, bogus science, bogus religion. But there is more. In Acts 15, the apostles outlawed cannibalism. The, the, the demonic practice of the ritual consumption of blood is cannibalism, vampire religion. Dracula stuff. Hey, Monsignor Dracula. It's vampire religion. It is cannibalistic. It is demonic. It is condemned by the word of God. The apostles, including Peter, banned it. Jesus says the flesh profits nothing. In the same passage, the apostles say it's completely outlawed to consume it. Forget about what Jesus said. Forget about what the apostles said. Forget about what the Bible says. Listen to Aristotle. But there's more. Roger quite aptly touched on it. Turn with me, please, in conclusion to Jeremiah 44. To understand biblical eschatology, to understand the last days, you have to understand that it recapitulates what happened in the last days of Judah. Also, the last days of Samaria, but particularly the last days of Judah, circa 720. BC, and the last days of Jerusalem and the events leading up to 70 AD, all those things foreshadow what will transpond eschatologically. In the last days of Judah, the threat was Babylon. That's why you see the New Testament picks up this motif, fallen, fallen is Babylon, from Jeremiah and from uh, Isaiah. You see the Babylon motif in Revelation. The idea of the temple, the temple, that was a big thing. In the last days, the temple becomes an issue. The New Testament eschatology recycles what happened in the last days of Babylon. Now, this is, again, a subject where we have many, many teaching tapes. It's too long of a subject and intricate to, to do anything more than touch on. However, let's look at this. What was happening in the last days of Babylon? Jeremiah 44, verse 15. Then all the men who were aware of their wives were burning sacrifices to other gods along with all the women who were standing by as a large assembly, including all the people who were living in Pathros in the land of Egypt. They responded to Jeremiah saying, As for the message that you've spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we're not going to listen to you. But rather we will certainly carry out every word that has proceeded from our mouths by burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out libations to her, just as we ourselves, our forefathers, our kings, our princes did in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food and were well off and saw no misfortune. You see, if you honor the queen of heaven, bad things don't happen. Peace will come through her. 
But since we stopped burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out libations to her, we've lacked everything and have met our end by the sword and famine. Why is there so much famine and heartbreak in the world? We've turned from Mother Mary. We sacrificed the cakes to her. As Roger said, there is the Marian aspect of the Eucharist and the Eucharistic aspect of Mary Olatry. And said the women, when we were burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven, we were pouring out libations to her. It was without our husbands that we made for the sacrificial cakes in her image and poured out libations to her. Women love the Mary thing. Not to be confused with Miriam, the real mother of Jesus. Now understand this. Other gods. In that book that Roger showed you, Peter Kreeft, I read that book. Mohammed is in heaven. Buddha is in heaven. We need to have ecumenical unity with Islam to morally redeem society. Who endorses that book? The son of Judas, Chuck Colson, the son of Judas, J.I. Packer. They say, what if he's right? They're sacrificing cakes to the queen of heaven. That's what they did when they were on their road to Babylon the last time. And that's what they're doing when they're on the road to Babylon today. Sacrificing their cakes to the Queen of Heaven. You see, only bad things happen when we stop being devoted to the Queen of Heaven. Now, if we turn back to the Queen of Heaven and we sacrifice the cakes, everything will be hunky-dory. Just ask Chuck Colson. He endorsed the book. No, no. I don't have a need to ask Chuck Colson. I don't have a need to ask J.I. Packer. I don't have a need to ask anybody because I asked Jesus Christ. He put it a little bit differently. In conclusion, turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Thyatira in Greek means continuing sacrifice. You want to come with us? We have a Bible study tour to the seven churches next April. Give us your name. We'll give you a brochure and bring you with us. I'll take you to this place. Continuing sacrifice as in the Mass. Verse 20, I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. It's not the queen of heaven. It's the spirit of false religion personified and typified by Jezebel. The adulteress from Proverbs, in figure, who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat food sacrificed to idols. Now this had a historical fulfillment. These seven churches in dispensational theology are seven periods of church history, among other things. And the population of Europe was wiped out like 60% between 20 and 30 million people in the bubonic plague. I gave her time to repent, but she wouldn't. I'll cast her upon a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds, I'll kill off her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. This Thyatira was historically judged in the first century and in the second century. That which Thyatira prefigures was judged in the Middle Ages. And the church of continuing sacrifice will be judged again. The judgment of Christ will come upon those who eat at Jezebel's table, as Elijah put it. You kneel down before bread and wine and worship it as God incarnate, then you eat it in an act of cannibalism? That's fine. Only please find another name for it. Don't call it Christianity. Christianity is already taken. Call it idolatry. Call it what the Bible does eating at Jezebel's table. 
Call it transubstantiation, call it the Mass, call it Rome. But don't call it Jesus Christ. That's not him. By all means, take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is central to our fellowship and worship. It's the memorial of what he did and the testimony of what he will do at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those who come to the Lord's table with unconfessed sin eat and drink judgment to themselves. People can become ill. People can even die prematurely by defiling his table. It is important. It is central to our faith and worship. But it's not cannibalism. It's not protoplasm under some appearances or Aristotelian accidents. It's what Jesus said. Zota su, zikroni. Do this in remembrance of me. God bless.